Peter, probably the most well-known of all of the disciples, the man who was the first to declare Jesus as the Messiah, and also the first to be called Satan by Jesus. He's a disciple so familiar, and yet there are things about him that maybe we don't know. Things between the lines and beyond the words of scripture that will help us not only to understand this man better, but also to see how his story impacts our own. Well, in this video, I'm going to share with you six insights into the person and life of Peter that both change the way that you see him and possibly even the way that you read the Bible. So let's begin. One of the things that you may know about Peter is that he is a leader among the disciples. But do you realize just how significant he is? For instance, Peter is the first name in all of the lists of the disciples. Every time, Peter is first. In fact, Matthew takes it a step further in his gospel. When he's listing the names of the disciples, he says, first, Peter. But the word that he uses for first is actually the Greek word protos. And protos doesn't just mean first in order. It means chief, leader of the group. He's letting us know that Peter is the lead disciple. His story is going to be critical. And this is abundantly apparent as we read the Gospels, especially given how many times Peter's name is mentioned in the Gospels. Peter is mentioned six times more than any other disciple. John, the beloved disciple, is mentioned 20 times by name. So is Judas. Andrew, Peter's brother, is mentioned 12 times. Thomas, 10 times. But Peter... Peter is mentioned by name over 120 times, which means that Peter is either central to the story or he made a nice deal with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get some extra shout outs. Next, let's talk about Peter's name. Peter's given name is Simon, which in Aramaic probably would have been pronounced Shimon. This is what he would have been called publicly from the time that he was a baby. And Simon is actually an incredibly common name in Peter's social sphere. There are at least seven Simons in the Gospels. Judas' dad was named Simon. We encounter Simon the Cyrene and Simon the Leper. Two of the disciples were named Simon. And what's really interesting about this name, Simon, is that it's related to the Hebrew word Shema, which means to listen or to obey. What makes this even more significant is that Shema is also the first word of the prayer that Peter and his fellow Israelites would have spoken every single day of their lives, a prayer called the Shema. This is the prayer that Jesus uses when he's asked what is the greatest of all of the commandments. It's a prayer full of devotion to God. And let's be honest, it's a prayer that reflects who Peter will become. Not only will Simon Peter be a faithful disciple of Jesus while Jesus is alive, he will be a central figure in spreading the gospel, opening the door for Gentiles to hear and experience the good news, and establishing the foundations of the church that we are a part of today. Because there were so many Simons at the time of Jesus, this Simon also had other names and distinctions. For instance, he's distinguished as Simon Bar-Jonah, meaning Simon son of Jonah. No doubt, this would have brought to mind images of the biblical Jonah, the man who was swallowed by a large fish. We know from scripture that Peter himself was a fisherman, and it's extremely likely that his father Jonah was too. But this distinction as Simon Bar-Jonah also highlights a few other things in the Gospels. First, it recalls for us that since many first names were so common, men at that time were often distinguished by the name of their father. Right? We see this among Jesus' disciples. Simon, son of Jonah, James, son of Alphaeus, Matthew, son of Alphaeus. And then second, the commonality of names also explains for us why we see disciples who have other names, like Matthew, also known as Levi, or Simon, also called Peter, James, the lesser, Simon, the zealot. It's how they distinguished people. And those cognomens were significant. They indicated something unique or important about that person, which is the case for Peter, right? Not only was the meaning of Peter's original name, Shimon, significant, but so too is this name, Peter. And that leads to insight number four, which is why call him Peter? The name Peter has its roots in ancient Greek. Petros is the Greek word for a rock. The Aramaic equivalent would have been the word kephas. 
We see this in Jesus' first interaction with Peter. John tells us this. And Andrew brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. This name becomes so much a part of Peter's identity that many people who read the Bible don't realize that Simon and Peter are both the same person. For many, the name Simon is lost. He's just Peter. And this isn't surprising. In the Gospels, he's called Peter twice as much as he's called Simon. But then, of course, that leads to the question, why Peter? Why Cephas? Well, there's one scene that seems to answer this better than any other. One day, Jesus and his disciples go to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, this is one of those places in scripture where a knowledge of the setting really gives a totally different perspective on the story. Caesarea Philippi was a place that for many years had been associated with the worship of pagan gods. But not long before Jesus was born, Herod the Great and later his son Philip began converting it to temples and other shrines devoted to worshiping the Roman emperor, Caesar. Hence the name Caesarea Philippi, right? Caesarea for Caesar and Philippi for Herod's son, Philip. Now, the location of Caesarea Philippi is nothing short of picturesque. Streams of water, a waterfall, a giant rock cliff which exposed the face of Mount Hermon and held within it a cave with a deep chasm into which people would send their offerings to the gods. And it's in this location that Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, the disciples respond, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, some say Jeremiah. And so then Jesus asks, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now think about this scene. In front of a giant rock cliff, in a place that has been dedicated to the worship of pagan gods for centuries, a place that is now dedicated to the emperor who claims to be God, Peter declares, you are the Son of God. Which prompts Jesus to respond, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, what's significant about this moment is that this is the first and only time that Jesus calls him Peter in Matthew's gospel. He calls him Simon. He even calls him Satan. But this is the only time that he calls him Peter. Matthew refers to him as Peter throughout the gospel. But this is the only time that Jesus does. And the word that is used for Peter here is, like I said earlier, the Greek word petros. But here's what's so unique about the word petros. There's another word for rock in Greek, lithos, which means a stone or a smaller rock. But the word petros is used to, to refer to a cliff or even a bedrock. So again, in front of this giant 70 foot tall rock cliff upon which sat Mount Hermon, Jesus says to Peter, you are no longer Simon, you are now Peter. Your name is rock. Upon this rock, I will build my church, which communicates two things. The church is being built on the rock, on the foundation that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God, the words that Peter professed earlier, but also that Simon is now the bedrock upon which Jesus is going to build this movement that will spread the gospel throughout the world. Peter was poor. Right? This is something that's pretty well known and accepted about him and most of the disciples, honestly. But did you know that there was actually a specific phrase in the Hebrew language to describe people like Peter? It was the phrase Am Haretz. The term literally means people of the land. What it refers to were people who were poor, who weren't educated, who were the lower class of society. And we actually see an example of people viewing Peter this way in Scripture. In Acts 4, the Sanhedrin referred to Peter and John as unschooled and ordinary. But the Greek words here are really interesting, right? The, the word for unschooled is this Greek word agramatos, which literally means illiterate and unable to write. The other word used here is actually even more interesting. When the Sanhedrin referred to, to Peter and John as ordinary, Scripture records the Greek word idiotes, from which we get the word idiot. And while idiotes isn't necessarily as severe as that pejorative, 
it wasn't exactly flattering either, right? It means an unskilled person, an amateur, an outsider. In other words, they're saying that Peter and John aren't versed in the law like the Sanhedrin, which actually ties into another meaning of Amharets. Amharets were typically known to be people who didn't closely observe the Jewish law. It's not just that they didn't know it, they also apparently didn't follow it. We actually see this sort of thing depicted in the first episode of The Chosen, when Peter is seen breaking the Sabbath in order to fish. Amharets weren't like the religious leaders. They didn't know the law, they didn't observe it like others did. And yet, it's the Amharets that Jesus chooses to be his disciples. It's the Amharets like Peter who will carry the good news of Jesus to the world, reminding them and us that we don't have a God who only chooses the wealthy and the learned. Jesus offers salvation to people like you and me, knowing full well our weakness and healing that weakness through his strength. So if you ever find yourself in a place where you don't feel good enough for God to love, where someone tells you that you're not good enough for God to use, just remember that Jesus' most trusted disciple was an Amharetz. And it's okay if we are too. In John's Gospel, we have this very intimate meeting between Peter and Jesus after the resurrection. Now, it's important to remember that this is an incredibly low point for Peter. He denied Jesus three times the day that Jesus was killed. And even though he saw Jesus after the resurrection, Jesus is still gone. And it feels like everything is over. And so what we see is that Peter and the disciples have gone out fishing. Now, this is either a sign that they've given up on ministry or that they're just biding their time for some reason. But, but either way, this is a low point. Suddenly, though, Jesus appears and gives this powerful closure to Peter's story. John tells us that while they're out fishing, they haven't caught anything, right? They aren't having any luck. They've been fishing through the night and they just haven't gotten a bite. But suddenly, they see this man on the shore who tells them to throw the net on the right side of the boat. And when they do, it says that they catch so many fish that they can't even haul it in. Now, this reminds us and Peter of another almost identical moment found in Luke's gospel. When Jesus is coming to invite Peter to be one of his disciples, Peter's out fishing and has had an unsuccessful night. So Jesus approaches and says this. He says, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Peter would have remembered that first moment. It would have been this reminder of who Jesus had called him to be, this mission that Jesus had invited him to be a part of. The fact that despite all that has happened, he is still called. Which is no doubt why as soon as this happens and John declares, it is the Lord, Peter jumps into the water to swim to Jesus. But just in case there's any doubt that Jesus is using this moment to redeem Peter, Look at what happens when Peter reconnects with Jesus. John tells us that when the disciples reach the shore, they find Peter and Jesus sitting around a charcoal fire cooking fish. Now, the word for charcoal here is anthrakian. And this word appears only one other time in the Gospels. John tells us that Peter warms himself by a anthrakian, a charcoal fire, while Jesus is on trial. And it's by this charcoal fire that Peter denies Jesus three times. Which is why in this later instance, again, sitting next to a charcoal fire, Jesus gives Peter a chance to redeem himself. And three times Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter professes his faithfulness to Jesus. It's this powerful bookend to the story, this reminder that not even our worst sins can separate us from Jesus. That if Jesus' closest friends could get a second chance after abandoning him in his moment of greatest need, then we too can have second chances, and third chances, and 23rd chances. Because the truth is, we're all a little bit like Peter. This is part of why so many of us are drawn to him in the Gospels, and in movies, and in shows like The Chosen. We see ourselves in him. 
We're reminded of the moments when we got it right, where we did exactly what Jesus asked of us. And we remember our mistakes, the moments when we totally didn't deserve the trust that Jesus had placed in us. And in all of that, we're reminded that if Peter can be redeemed, if Jesus chooses to use someone like him to grow the kingdom of God, then he can use us too. So if you're someone who is feeling especially down as you watch this video today, if you've made some mistakes recently that you're ashamed of, if you've been told by people in the church that you're not good enough, if you feel unworthy of God's love, then I want you to hear these words. You are in good company. Even Jesus' own disciples felt this way. But here's the thing, right? Something Jesus tells us and Peter is proof of it. There is nothing in this world that can keep you from the love of Jesus. Even your worst mistakes can be redeemed. And when you surrender your life to him, when like Peter, you let him be your savior and your Lord, then you can have a new life, a fresh start to be who God has created you to be and to experience the amazing mission that God has waiting for you of continuing what Jesus started 2,000 years ago. That's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video and I plan to produce some videos on other disciples in the months ahead if you're interested. Right now though, if you haven't done so already, please take a moment to go down below and click the thumbs up to say that you like the video. And then while you're down there, please click that subscribe button and the bell next to it so that you hear about these videos as soon as they're released. Have a great week. We'll see you next time and God bless.